the beginning Can't control what tomorrow will bring But I know here in the middle Is the place where you promise to be
Hallelujah, church. He is worthy. He is worthy of all our praise tonight. God is good. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Sometimes we may feel that God's not there. We don't hear him. We don't feel him. But I'm here to tell you tonight, God will not forsake you. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He says his word, I shall not forsake you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And lo, I am with you, even to the ends of the earth. I'm so thankful that I don't always feel God, but when I know that he's there, church, I know that I know that I know that he is there. Hallelujah. There's been times in my life where I wake up and I'd be, pastor, I'd be praying hard, just trying to feel the presence of God. And then I'd get in my truck and I'd be driving to work and all of a sudden, bam, out of nowhere, it just fills the truck. And I'm like, Jesus, take the wheel. And I, I know that there's, if we base our feelings on what God is, we are mistakenly. He's not feeling, he is a knowing. And to know that he's always with me, no matter what I go through, all my struggles and trials, God is right beside me. And I'm glad when I wake up in the morning, he's right there when I wake up. He's right there when I go to bed. He's right there when I'm sleeping. He has never left me. Hallelujah. And for us, let's get ready. We'll take up our tithes and offering. I can't contain my excitement, church. You know, my testimony is not better or worse than anybody else's. But man, when I think of what he brought me out of, I have to praise him. There was those that said, he'll never make it. I myself said, God, just take me. I'm not going to make it. But when he stepped in on the scene and changed my life around, I got in my closet last night and looked at all the stuff that I have. Two years ago, church, I didn't have a closet. I had a backpack. One pair of underwear, one pair of socks, one pair of shirt, one pair of pants. And to see what God's done for me now, it's unbelievable. He can do it for me. He can do it for anybody. I'm telling you. Church, let's do our decoration together. Upon the authority of your word, I have given it shall be given to me. Press down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the any is rebuked, the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and walking with God. Perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessings. I am blessed going in and I'm blessed going out. All that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Do you believe that, Todd? Let's worship to the Lord. Take all I have in these hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on. The altar again, set me on fire, set me on fire. Here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life.
Come on, church, all over this place. Can we lift our hands up and surrender tonight? I'm telling you right now, you whatever you got in your mind, in your heart, and your spirit right now, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. Oh, ya na la ba kanta le ba si anda ya la ba hata. Hallelujah, da ya na ria shaba hakata ya la ba sata. Oh, church, there's somebody here tonight in the sound of my voice, either watching or here. I felt my spirit so strong when I was so there worshiping and praising God. Somebody here feels like God's doing something in their life and they just can't see it. Lord, why am I going through this? God might be silent, but I'm here to tell you, He's not left you. You're going to come out of this a lot stronger than you was when you went in it. Just believe God's doing a great work in your life right now. You don't have to understand it. Just know that He is God. He's not trying to punish you. He's trying to help you grow and learn in Him. Claim it in the name of Jesus. Come on, church. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I'm learning, Pastor, in my walk with God that sometimes it's just got to surrender. You know, even though I'm, I have the human fallen nature in my life where I, I still have sin fighting within me, that my struggles are for a reason. I'm learning that a struggle is not necessarily a sin. It's because I'm fighting. I'm fighting not to sin. To me, that's what, to me, it's what a struggle is in my life. I, I, I have struggles now that I know I would never do in my, in my past like I used to. But I realize that when I surrender to God and not try to fight it all, my, all on my own, I come out of it ahead and I come out of a top. A lot of times we as people think we can do this on our own. There ain't no way. You cannot do this. You cannot do this on your own. You have to have God. You have to reach out to Him and say, Lord, I surrender to you right now. Help me, God, today. Hallelujah. We have a lot to go in prayer for. Sister Kathy Fair is recovering from surgery. Reverend Billy Huey for his stroke. Sister Whitley and her kidneys. We have Hunter Henry who has acid reflex. Paul Wagner's father passed away. Amy Burnett recovering from surgery. And Sister Gwen Mills. We know that God can do all these needs. Do we not, church, believe that God can do all these needs? If you have a need tonight, I want you to raise up your hands and raise your other hand. We're going to go, Lord, in prayer and believing that God's going to do great things in this prayer meeting right now. Father, we thank you, Lord. I thank you for what I already feel tonight, God. Lord, I speak healing on every single need and name that we're spoken. Every hand that was raised, God, whatever the need may be, if it's financial, spiritual, mental, emotional, God. Lord, I claim victory right now. I believe that, God, great things will happen in this service tonight. Already, God, we feel your spirit. I pray for the anointing upon our pastor tonight, God, our praise and worship team, God, to touch each and every one that's here tonight, God. Lord, let your glory shine upon this church. Let it shine outside the walls of this church that people go by, they see the glory of God upon us, God. Lord, continue to help us today, God, learn and grow in you. I bind every demonic spirit here tonight, God, and I give you glory and honor for what we're about to receive tonight, God, in Jesus' name. Come on, church, everybody say, in Jesus' name. If you believe it, clap your hands unto the Lord. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe, yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here for you. Come and do. God, we believe, 
Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. to him can we thank him this this evening hallelujah we're so blessed thank you god thank you for your presence hallelujah thank you lord for the truth of your presence hallelujah praise god amen it's not just to make us feel something uh, amen it's not like a amen just take this to make you feel better uh, but Amen. The Spirit of God is able to minister to the very root, core, and cause. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Aren't you thankful for that freedom? Amen. Praise God. I certainly appreciate His presence. So good to see each of you this evening. Amen. It's a, an honor to be in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. Every morning, my my son and I, Rod and I, we, we go to the gym, and it's right about sunrise, and so we've noticed that we've been going about three months or so, and uh, we're, we're, before when we would turn there on, I guess that's Market Street, the sun would be right there. Well, now it's like way over here. Of course, obviously, the earth is tilting, and uh, here in about, oh, 15 days or just, well, about 12 days from now, 12 or 13 days, it'll get to its furthest point, and then, thank the Lord, it starts turning the other direction. Amen. We'll have our shortest day of the year, and then from then on, about a minute a day, it's added to. Amen. How many here was ready for spring? I know winter hadn't even started, but anyway... Uh, but but I'm, I'm thankful there there are limits, amen. Again, it'll only go so far, and then it starts turning the other direction, amen. I believe here tonight that the enemy would like for you to think that it's going to keep going, it's going to get worse, it's going to get beyond any type of recovery, any type of restoration. But I'm telling you, God determines where it ends, where it, where it begins, amen. And I'm thankful for a great God here today that is able to turn things around in my life. Anybody here ever made a mess in your life? Amen. Praise God. And uh, I'm thankful for God who's able to restore and put the pieces back together. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, I want to go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 14. Amen. I I had no idea they were going to sing that song. Amen. About we need a move. Amen. My title tonight is Somebody Make a Move. (laughs) Amen. Praise God. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse number 1. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines, garrison that is on the other side, but he did not tell his father. Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gabeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. I want to skip down to verse 6, and uh, this is the New Living Translation. This is, uh, this is Jonathan speaking to his armor bearer. He says, let's go across to the outpost of those pagans. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, perhaps, everybody say perhaps. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. Just think about that for a moment. Nothing can hinder the Lord the Lord. It, it, it seems to me that if you have something that goes wrong in the early morning of your day, it just seems to create other things to go wrong the rest of the day. Let me tell you, God never wakes up to a bad morning. Amen. He never wakes up. He never sleeps. He doesn't have bad days. Nothing can hinder the Lord. Amen. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. The size of your army does not matter. Amen. The amount of your ability does not matter because nothing can hinder the Lord and He can win a a battle whether He has many or whether He has few. Amen. Because with Him, He's the majority. Amen. Praise God. I Just for a few moments this, this evening, amen, I want to talk to you about somebody make a move. God, we love you. We thank you today for your blessing. We're thankful for your word, your presence. And I do pray as always, God, again, that you would anoint our, the eyes of our understanding. God, increase it, Lord. Help us to see clearly. Help, help us to have comprehension, Lord, here tonight. We thank you. We give you honor. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, everybody said in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. You can be seated for a moment. I love the story here in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And, uh, you know, as I'm, as I'm, I'm sure you're, you're, you're probably somewhat like myself. Uh, when you're reading uh, and, and, and the story is unfolding in your mind, you're, you're kind of creating it in your own imagination. And uh, I, I, can, I can see Jonathan kind of sneaking away from his dad, who is the king, and uh, doing, doing this kind of thing, which is an extreme risk because uh, it's just him and his armor bearer and uh, they're going to go up against the Philistines, and, and they're really not in any, any place to do that. It's not, it's not really their, uh, uh, their specialty, so to speak. But, but again, Jonathan does this and says, well, perhaps the Lord will, will come through. 
Let me give you a little bit of context of, 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 of the story here. We've we got to go back to chapter 13. And the Bible tells us in verse 19 that there were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, or sickles, they had to take them to the Philistine blacksmith. The charges were as follows, a quarter of an ounce of silver for sharpening a plowshare or a pick, an eighth of an ounce of, of, uh, for, of, of silver for uh, sharpening an axe, sickle, or an ox goad. Now verse 22, so on the day of the battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or a spear except for Saul and Jonathan. Now in our reading this, this evening, we found that there are 600 people that are with Saul and out of those 600 people, there are only two swords. And one of them is Saul's, and one of them is Jonathan's. Amen. The Israelite army was at a great disadvantage. And yet Jonathan still says to his armor bearer, Perhaps the Lord will help us. Let's you and me, let's go and let's, let's go to the outpost of these pagans. And perhaps the Lord will help us. For, the, for nothing can hinder the Lord. Even though we've only got one sword, and even though there's only two of us, amen, still yet, nothing can hinder the Lord. Even though I, I'm, not, I'm not really designed for this, I don't have this talent, this, is not, this, is, this does not match my personality, uh, amen, whatever, whatever person was matching job qualifications, they really messed up with me, but even then, nothing can hinder the Lord. Whatever you're facing, whatever challenge you're having to endure tonight, you may wonder what in the world, I, there is no way I'm able to make a difference, uh, and you may be exact, absolutely right and correct in that statement but nonetheless nothing can hinder the Lord amen again I, 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 I want to be very redundant here this evening because no matter what we can or cannot do no matter what resources we're lacking none of that will ever hinder the Lord the Lord is still mighty amen the Lord is still able the Lord is still powerful the Lord is still able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything I can imagine. Amen. Now again, it's one thing to be outnumbered by your enemy. But it's another to be outnumbered and to be without weapons. The context of the story shows us the gravity of this situation. And it truly gives us the insight or just how difficult that this could be. If, if we were there with Jonathan and if he was a close friend of ours, most likely, I'm just, I'll speak for me, I would say, Jonathan, you really need to consider what you're doing here. You need to really think this out. You only got one sword and your armor bearer, he, he's, he's not a warrior and it's just you two and, and, and all you're going on is maybe the Lord will help you. I really kind of, you need to consider your options here today. It really is a, a tough challenge that you're going to try to take on. And you're really volunteering for this. Nobody has told you to do this. Amen. But we read where Jonathan's focus again is not on his ability or that of his armor bearer, but rather it is upon the God that he serves. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can hinder him. And he's able to win the battle whether he's got many warriors or just a few. Hallelujah. I have often referenced to Peter when he was in the boat during that great storm and Jesus comes walking on the water. And I've often said that before, before Peter stepped out of the boat, amen, he did ask, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come. Amen. Peter was thinking really pretty clearly that day because if all he had was his own ability, it would be disastrous for him. But he knew that if it was Jesus, then Jesus would be able to do whatever he couldn't do. Amen. No, no matter what he could not 
God accomplished, Jesus would be able. I'm telling you, friend, I don't know how, how more to say it, but Jesus makes the difference in our lives. Amen. We can sit here this evening and we can list all the things that we cannot do and that list would be very long, but none of that, amen, will hinder the God in which we serve. Hallelujah. Well, Jonathan, you may not be thinking real clearly, but how would you like to be the armor bearer? I mean, the armor bearer had an obligation to go where Jonathan said. The armor bearer really did not have an option here. Amen. And so Jonathan, in my opinion, did not offer really a lot of great words of encouragement to, to the armor bearer. He said, hey, come on, buddy, let's go and let's take on these Philistines. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe if you were the, if I was the armor bearer, I would be thinking, okay, what's your plan, boss? Uh, you got something really planned out here? You got a great strategy that we can go by? We're just going to go and maybe the Lord will help us. I don't know about you, but if I was the armor bearer, I'd be shaking in my boots every step. Uh, what an, oh my goodness, what is he getting us into? Uh, amen. But Jonathan says to his armor, he says, perhaps the Lord will help us. The word perhaps, it, it has a few meanings. One is unless. Unless the Lord helps us, we are, we are, we are up a creek without a paddle. You've heard of that before? Amen. We have got trouble if the, unless the Lord is there, we ain't got no chance. And that is very true. But it also means, or can mean, who knows? Maybe the Lord will help us. I don't like that. Now, 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 if I, if I'm asking, uh, uh hey, uh, uh, honey, what, what are we having for supper tonight? And she says, who knows? That's not a big deal. All right. If she's not really sure what we're having, guess what? As you can tell, I will find something I will survive. But this is not a situation where a who knows response would be something I would really like to hear. I'd like to have a little more con, something more concrete than that. Who knows? But I love this. This is exactly what the lexicon says. That the word perhaps, it is a marker showing uncertainty. You think? <laughs> I mean, I mean, Pastor, you talk about all the time how, how with, with God it's, it's possible, with man it's impossible, but, and, and here you're thinking, well, if God don't show up, then we're sunk, and, and that, that, yeah, that's uncertainty. But, amen, usually an expectancy that a positive will happen. Meaning, exactly what Jonathan was thinking was, uh, you and I, buddy, we ain't got a chance. Uh, we will never survive this. Uh, you and I are not going to go in here uh, and, and, and take charge. But I'm telling you, uh, we've got a great God that nothing can hinder Him. And whether we're two or whether we're 2,000, it doesn't matter. God is going to be victorious. Uh, I'm expecting a positive in this situation. Amen. Now, for those of you that are saying, all right, that sounds good, but it, it, don't, it don't work. Let me tell you, the reason it don't work is you're more focused on the negative. You're more focused on what you cannot do, and you're not focused on what He can do. I'm telling you, friend, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Our perception of Him needs to get bigger, and it's not going to get bigger unless you get closer to Him. The closer you get to God, the bigger He becomes, and the more you realize and understand that nothing, can hinder my God. Hallelujah. Now, I, I reference a lot also to a story of Hezekiah and the king of Assyria who comes and he makes these great threatenings and boastings as to what he's going to do. And, and, and so far, there had not been a God who anywhere who's been able to keep him from doing the very things that he says. Now Hezekiah is king, but he's, he's a man. He's, a, he's just like you and I. He's nothing supernatural. And so when he hears these threatenings, and, and he knows that what he's saying is true, he knows that some of the surrounding kingdoms have, have been overcome and, and conquered by this very king of Assyria. And so the Bible tells us, uh, amen, in, in Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 1, and so it was when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes. He covered himself with sackcloth. And he went to the house of the Lord. Now, what he is saying is, I don't have a chance of fixing this on my own. 
I am humbling myself under the mighty hand of God because I cannot rely on my own strength or my ability. And then he went to the house of the Lord. That's a good place to go. Now, how many are thankful tonight that he is a help in a time of need? That he is a strong tower that the righteous can run there unto? He gets to the house of God. He sent El Elkim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the of the priests, and covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz. And they said to him, Here's what the king says. This day is a day of trouble, and rebuke, and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. Basically, if I can interpret this in my own, my own words here, okay? Amen. I, I, I'm no theologian. But basically, Hezekiah is saying, we are set up for a great victory, but we ain't got no ability to do it. We've got an opportunity to overtake, amen, this great king, but we don't have the strength to pull it off. We cannot do this alone. Notice what Isaiah says. His first words were, it may be, <laughs> which is the exact same word in the original language as perhaps, ah, it may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of, of Rabbishakah, who is the messenger, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. Isaiah is saying, Hezekiah, you've got every right to have the sackcloth on. You have every right to be, to be concerned because you can't fix this. But I'm going to tell you, you got a God who just may step in. He just may intercede. He may just turn things around and that's the story where God he sends one angel and one angel destroys 180 or 185,000 enemies again nothing shall hinder your God you have to consider Jonathan's conditions here in that he has a father who happens to be king or at least for the time being now you go the early part I think it's chapter 13 uh, that's where Saul really majorly disobeyed God, okay? So he's not going to be king for much longer. But, but, but for now, he's king. And, uh, but, but he had just, again, disobeyed God's command. And so now Jonathan may, may not have a whole lot to go on except for his own personal relationship with God, if you will. Dad, Dad's rebellious. Dad's made some big mistakes, I know he's king and I know he's got a position of authority, but, but he's out of line with God. And so I don't have his covering no longer. So, so what are you going to do, Jonathan? Amen. Jonathan was a, amen. He was a confidant with David. David was a man after God's own heart. And Jonathan and David were great friends. And again, Saul was trying to pin David to the wall, but, but Jonathan loved David. And, I mean, Jonathan was a good, he was a good man. And, and, and here again, his, his dad was, was coming up short, but, but, but Jonathan was, you know, Jonathan was not to be identified with his dad. Now, he, he, he did pay the consequences. I mean, Jonathan ended up losing his life. And, and you can pinpoint that back to his own dad. His dad caused that. But I'm telling you, amen, you and I this morning or this evening, uh, we may be living uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a line of, of, of our heritage. Uh, your, your dad and your family, uh, amen, they may be the least godly people that you know. But I'm telling you, you're, you don't have to be identified and think, well, since I don't have a fourth or fifth uh, a generation of our apostolic and lineage, in my, in my family, I can do nothing for God. You and your relationship with God, I'm telling you, nothing can hinder the God in which we serve. Amen. Due to his father's, what well, wasn't really his father's policies, it was the Philistines' policy. They, they, you know, they had to depend on the Philistines to make and sharpen the blades. And because of that, now they only got two swords in the entire Israelite army. So Jonathan must have thought somebody has got to do something. And it might as well be me. Amen. Let, let me summarize a little bit what takes place here. This comes from verses 13 through 22. So they climbed up using both hands and feet and the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed those who came behind them and they killed some 20 men in all. Suddenly, panic broke out of the, in the Philistine army. 
both in the camp and in the field, including even the outposts and raiding parties. And then Saul and all, of the, and all his men rushed out to battle and, and found the Philistines killing each other. And even the Hebrews who had previously gone over to the Philistine army revolted and they joined in with Saul and Jonathan and the rest of the Israelites. And likewise, the men of Israel who were hiding in the hill country of Ephraim, they also joined the chase and they saw the Philistines running away. Now you have two people, two men that have one sword and it starts with them killing 20 people. Amen. God, God, that, that's a good day. It's, that's, a, that's a victory. But it didn't end there because it just continued to gain momentum. And as it gained momentum, more joined in on the, on the team, if you will, and more joined in. And, and before long, instead of just the, those 20, I mean, they, they ran the whole army out of, the, out of town. Amen. This is a very powerful story of something that's called synergy. S-Y-N-E-R-G. It is defined as the increased effectiveness that results when two or more people work together. Amen. Yeah, I can stand my own. And, I, and having done all to stand, I will stand. But it's a whole lot better if I can stand together with somebody else. Where two or three are, are together in agreement with one. Amen. Jesus is in the midst of them. That's a good, that's a good equation. Again, nothing shall hinder our Lord. And He can win the battle whether He's got many or whether He's got few. Amen. Synergy means a team cannot perform the, 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 the effort of the best member of the team. Amen. It also means a team will produce a better result than if each person within the group was working toward the same goal as individual members. Again, let me summarize. We are better together. Amen. A motorist was driving down a lonely country road and he blew a tire. Skidded off the road into the ditch. He flipped his car upside down. He managed to get out and, of the car, but he, he knew that he was in the middle of nowhere. About the time that he was about ready to panic, a farmer came down the road in a, in a cart pulled by a blind mule named Gus. The farmer offered to have Gus pull the car out of the ditch. The man was very skeptical because Gus, the blind mule, a man looked very weak and frail, but he agreed anyway because he really had no other options to get his car back on the road. And so the farmer, amen, takes Gus and, amen, and uh, connects the rope to the car and he cracked his whip up in the air and he yelled, Yeah! Pull, Sam, pull! The mule didn't move. Farmer got his whip again. He cracked that whip and he yelled out, Yeah, there, Jake, pull, pull, Jake, pull. The mule did not move. Once more, the farmer cracked his whip and he shouted, Yeah, there, Pete, come on, Pete, pull, Pete, pull. Still, Gus did not move. And then the farmer cracked his whip and he shouted, Yeah, there, Gus, come on, Gus, pull, Gus, pull. And at that moment... Gus dug into his scrawny hind legs and pushed through the dirt and he began to surge forward and soon enough the car turned right side up came rolling out of the ditch back onto the road and the motorist was shocked he was appreciative and he was curious he asked the farmer why he called out all those other names the farmer simply replied said, well Gus is blind and if he thought it was just up to him alone to pull that car out of the ditch, he wouldn't even have tried. But when he thought he had help and support of others, he was much more stronger than he even thought he could be. Amen. We are better together. Can I tell you tonight that it is more than just a desperate plea or action that is needed? Amen. Sometimes... That is where it starts. It starts with a Jonathan that says, you know what, we got to do something. Come on, buddy, let's go. I know we're not prepared. I know we're not equipped. But I'm telling you, maybe the Lord will help us. And I know He can't be hindered. And He don't need a whole big army to do a great thing. Sometimes that's where it's got to begin. Amen. But let me tell you, friend, but to get to where we really need to be, there has to be a change in our mindset. Changing the way we think involves seeing reality. 
Amen. Now, I say often as well, your perception is your reality. But your perception may not be correct. Amen. Most of us, however, we struggle with seeing reality. Amen. And our inability to see it is the reason why most of our change initiatives don't work. See, seeing reality involves our seeing things as they really are, not as we hope or think they might be. Reality can be painful. Reality can be something that we really don't want to see. Matter of fact, a lot of times it's a a survival mechanism in in, in in the way we're made. We, We try to avoid reality at all costs. Because again, reality is too scary and it's too opposite from what we really know and want and desire to be. It is impossible to solve a problem that has not been defined. Amen. Praise God. We, we have our upstairs bathroom. Our shower head leaks. And it's one of those that it's like one, what do you call that? Handle. And, and it's, it, it operates both everything, all right? So it's not like two handles, it's just one handle. And, and, and you, you know, like sometimes you, you, you got those old ones where you can just really, you know, tighten it hard and it, it helps it. This here, there's none of that. So, so you know how, how I fixed it? I just turned the water off every time. It quits leaking. But that's not, that's not how you fix it. The problem is I don't know how to fix it. And the problem, really the, really the problem is if I try to fix it, I'll make a bad problem probably worse. Amen. But if you don't identify or define what the problem is, you'll never never solve it. And if we misdiagnose the problem, guess what we'll do? We will administer the wrong solution. And oftentimes the problem is not a willingness on the part of the people to do what needs to be done. The problem is often a lack of knowledge or know-how. Amen. You know how irritating it is to hear that water drip? Bible, Proverbs talks about that. I mean, you'd almost want to be on... Anyway, it's, it's aggravating. That's why we turn the water off. But still, the reason that it's not fixed is I don't have the know-how or the knowledge in order to do that. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. The word knowledge refers to the capacity. It refers to the content. The recollection one has for knowing someone, especially based on one's own experience. So knowledge, it's more than just grabbing a book. Well, that's, that's what we used to do when we were kids. It's more than just opening your tablet and Googling something for information. Knowledge is more than just getting information at your fingertips. But knowledge is truly increasing your very own capacity in order to have the content and to recollect. Amen. Again, knowing someone. Hallelujah. Amen. Based on your experience. Can I, can I tell you tonight, we need less ought to sermons amen and more how to sermons amen well, what what do you mean pastor well we we can i can get up here all day long and tell you what you ought to do and and, and it's and it's right you you ought to be faithful you ought to pray you ought to read your bible you ought to be a student of the word you and all those are correct but at some point we've got to start saying this is how you do it Amen. Instead of saying you ought to, and, and, and then, because what happens if that's all we do is ought to, ought to, ought to, we put pressure on people to do something, but if they don't have the knowledge of how to do it, it's never going to get done. It is impossible to truly define success, amen, without clearly defining what your purpose is. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie these two together in a second. You may refer to something as a success, but if it does not align with the purpose, it really isn't a success. Amen. God did not call us to fill churches with people. 
because, and let me clarify that, I'm not against filling the church with people. But just getting people inside the building is not what we've been called to do. Amen. Because whether you, because if we base success on the number of people, amen, there's, you know, that's up and that's down. Amen. Because Jesus, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, just a second. Success is not determined by numbers of crowds. Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus less successful in ministering to one woman at the well as to a multitude of people being fed with two small fishes and five loaves of bread? I mean, he was equally successful in both situations, not because of the number of people, but rather what occurred with the people. The number does not change the purpose. Amen. It's what happens to the people that's in the building. Amen. Yeah, we would love to have a crowd full of people, but that's not what we're focused on here. Amen. Because you can have a, you can have a church full of people, but nothing's happening to the people. Amen. As a church, we don't want to be a lake church. We want to be a river church. A lake church sees how many people you can get in the lake, but they don't go nowhere. We want to be a river church because we want the people in our church to get to where they're going. Hallelujah. The earthly ministry of Jesus, when it came to an end, the crowds deserted him. Does this mean that he was a failure? Absolutely not. But if we base our definition of success on numbers, amen, then Jesus' finest hour would be his biggest failure. But that is not true. Jesus was a success, amen. It was seen in his faithfulness to his purpose. And we are successful when we are faithful with our purpose. What is our purpose? Boy, I'm glad you asked. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Paul writing, he said, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Verse 12 says, For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. When Paul speaks of equipping the church or equipping others, he uses the word katartisamon. <laughs> I'm not Greek. But it conveys that church leaders are to help others become what God meant them to be. The purpose of the fivefold ministry is to help people perform their God ordained purpose or ministry. Amen. It is not to get you to respond to the presence of God. Now, hear me out. My job up here is to not be a cheerleader. Amen. And I, I, I've been in churches where, where the, the, the service leader will just get right down and ugly at people because you're not worshiping. And I, I, and I understand where I, I feel that many times. But I'm telling you, just to get you to get up and move something, that, that, that's not a lasting effect. Amen. Because in reality, if, if you don't love, I cannot make you love Jesus. I cannot make you commit yourself to God. I cannot make you submit yourself to God. But if you ever do, I'm telling you, friend, amen, God will bless your life. Yes, because worship comes from revelation. Worship comes from understanding who He is. Amen. The more I understand, the more I want to worship Him. So for those that may not worship God, and I understand we're not all the same and we have different personalities, but I'm telling you, as I've always said, amen, there's going to be, you're going to show some kind of appreciation. There's going to be some kind of expression. You may not be as loud as others, but something's got to get out of you because when you realize how great God is, you can't just sit there, amen. It's a relationship. It's a love thing with Him. Notice the focus of Ephesians chapter 4. Paul's not focusing on establishing whether or not the, the apostle is more important than a pastor or if a pastor is more important than that of, a, of an evangelist. Neither is Paul focusing on, on how each office is to function. Instead, his focus, his focus is on the purpose. Amen. Paul, in the following, is the purpose of the fivefold ministry, which again is equipping others 
for the work of ministry. Equipping. Amen. Now, let me, let me bring you into my prayer time for the last couple of weeks. Amen. It's been, it's been that kind of like God's raking me over the coals. Because I am a creature of habit. I honestly like my routines. Amen. I enjoy... I know we're getting ready to go on vacation here next week. It's a love-hate relationship I have with vacation. Because vacation gets me out of my routine. And I don't like getting out of my routine. It's, It's a problem I have and I need to work on it. But, amen, God has been challenging me because I only know what I know because of what I've been taught. And, and, and I'm not by no means, I, I, I've been blessed. I've had great men that have invested in my life and thank God for them. Amen. My, my, my pastor when I got in church my, was my father-in-law, Brother Lewis, a wonderful man. Amen. I, I'm telling you, I, I learned how to love people with him, from, through him. I, I learned he was, he's one of the most giving men you will ever find. Amen. And I, I remember many times questions I had. He, he, knew, he knew scripture and, and man, I, any time I had a question, he had an answer. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm so thankful for that. But it was a different time. I remember we had church on Tuesday night. And if you were on the ministry team with Brother Lewis, uh, there were many times. Church started at 6.30 or 7.30. And I'd get to church about 6.45. I'd walk in the door Hey, Brother Jeff, you got one for tonight? I sure do. I, I knew to have something ready. I mean, and, and, I mean you, you got about that kind of a warning. Very few times did you get a call the day before. Hey, I want you to preach tomorrow night. Hey, Amen. Here, I like to give ministers at least a week's notice. Hey, you're preaching. You know, just, just I mean, I, I, I would appreciate that. Hey, Amen. But that's how it was. I, I remember Brother Lewis many times when, when his Sunday morning lesson... You know when he got that Sunday morning lesson together? Sunday morning. And there's nothing wrong with that. He did a great job. He was a wonderful teacher. And his lessons, his notes were nothing but scriptures. And again, thank God for that. But it is a different time now. Not saying that that was wrong, but, I, but my point is this. We, 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 the way we've always done things, amen, has gotten us where we are, and thank God for that. But I'm telling you, if, if, if we're thinking the model of a church is the pastor doing everything. I, I've, I've been there. I remember Brother Lewis getting a call in the middle of the night to help unclog somebody's commode. I remember many, many, and, I, and again, I could, I could share story after story. And so much so that he told me when I started pastoring, he said, Jeff, don't ever learn to do anything. <laughs> he had a he had a business where he, he rebuilt cars. He had to go out of business because you know what he did? He gave all the cars away to the people in the church. Amen. Let me, let me tell you, and again, times have changed in 20 years. Yes, they have. The pressure that is on the pastor. And I'm not, I'm not here looking for pity, but I, I just want to read you a few, a few statistics. Amen. That, 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 have been, that I've read here recently. Among professionals, and this includes doctors, lawyers, you name it, clergy has the second highest divorce rate. 50% of marriages end in divorce. Amen. A hundred percent of pastors, and these are like 1,200 pastors that were surveyed. A hundred percent of the pastors had a close associate or a, or a friend from seminary who had left the ministry because of burnout, conflict in the church, or a, or a moral failure. Eighty-nine percent of pastors surveyed has considered leaving the ministry at one time. Fifty-seven percent would leave the ministry if they had a better place to go, including secular work. Seventy-one percent of pastors stated that they were burned out, battled depression, beyond fatigue on a weekly and even a daily basis. Amen. Considering all these statistics, and there's many more, it's no wonder, and, and the, again, this is, this is the, the, the findings of this survey, that 60 to 80 percent of those who enter the ministry will have left it in 10 years, and only a very small fraction will stay in it as a lifetime career. I'm telling you, Amen. Men like Brother Kirby, who we didn't realize what we had while he was here, to be faithful all those years. I'm telling you, amen. They were prince of men. 
And I, I, I'm, I'm sharing this with you because th- this is where we're living at today. Amen. As a pastor, I want to do a better job. Amen. And, and this, is, this is where the challenge comes because the way I've always been, and again, whether I've been taught this or this is just how I felt, that, that we just got to have, we got to preach better sermons, we got to have better worship experiences, and all that's wonderful. And we're going to try to shoot for the stars in those regards. But I'm going to tell you, you know how we're going to really make the difference in this world? Is somehow we may have to change our tactics when it comes to making sure that the people that are sitting in these chairs tonight are equipped. Amen. I thank God for the preached word. And I don't ever want to dilute the preached word. It is, it is vital. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Yes, absolutely. But at the same time, if I think as a pastor uh, that I'm going to have my greatest influence, uh, amen, from standing here behind this pulpit uh, and think that that's how I'm going to equip everybody, I'm telling you, friend, what did Jesus do? He spent the majority of his time with a very small group of people. And he invested in those 12. And those 12 went on to change the entire world. That's why the commission is to go into all the world, preach the gospel, making disciples. Amen. Equipping, the word means complete furnishing. Amen. My parents growing up, we never bought new furniture. We had some of the ugliest furniture you can imagine. We had orange furniture. We had the green felt velvet furniture. It was always something given to us. Nothing ever matched. We never had matching lamps or in or in tables. Our table, oh, our table, hey amen. I don't know where we got it at, but it, you know you had to be careful where you you couldn't lean too much on one of those areas. But complete furnishing. Amen. I, I remember my mom dreaming when she was when we were younger, thinking, Oh, I would love to go to the furniture store and just pick out brand new everything and just make you know, that would be wonderful. Let me tell you, as a as a as a child of God, we, we need to be equipped. We need to have complete furnishing. We we don't need to get by with any we, we need to we need to in, envelop ourselves so, so that we can be equipped completely. I say all of this that to say this, and we're getting ready to land. There is no reason for there only being two swords in the entire army, especially on the day of battle. Amen. Every single one of us here today are warriors for him. And if we're relying on just a handful or a couple people to have a sword, amen, I'm telling you, friend, it ain't going to happen. Amen. Especially... When you and I, the Bible says, amen, Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Study to show thyself approved, a workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Amen. And here I, here I go. You ought to be a student, right? Amen. And as a pastor... I'm telling you, I, I just I feel I feel in my spirit God is challenging me. Amen. I want to do a better job of helping to equip you to be able to be a student of this book. Amen. To be able to to become a prayer warrior. Amen. Come on. I, I, I'm asking you tonight. I, I, I welcome your prayers. Pastor, teach me how. Jesus talked about prayer and his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus wasn't just telling them how important it was, but he, he showed them. Now, 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 now let, me, let me clarify this, though. Amen. We can have the greatest teaching. We can have the greatest equipping ministry. But it all, it all starts with your heart. Amen. I want to have a heart for God. I want to have a heart for more of Him. I want, to, I want my heart to be prepared, amen, to be what God would want me to be. As we stand here today, somebody make a move. Amen. The world depends on it. Your neighbor might depend on it.
This region, this city depends on it. Church, I, I refuse to just go through motions. I refuse to just, amen, exist and, and uh, you know, again, thank God for what God has done. I'm so grateful for everything. But I, I don't know about you, but I feel a challenge in my own spirit that says, amen, we, we, we got to step it up. And in stepping it up, it's not, it's not about shouting louder, or, or but it, it's about, you know what, we need to be more equipped. Amen. Praise God. We, we've, got, we've got professionals in our, in our church. Amen. Praise God. Sister Dorothy, is, she's, a, she's a nurse, but in, but in her position, I don't want to embarrass her, but, but in her position, you know, what, you know what her primary job is? Training. She trains. And, and, and those of you that have had VNA nurses, you're thankful that they're trained. I don't want to be sitting in a chair and a nurse come up to me and got a needle and I'm like, okay, what do I do with this? I'm glad they're trained. I'm, I'm glad that they, they, there's, and it's not just they passed the test one time, that there, it's continual, continual education. Amen, church. Thank God for the Acts 238 message. Thank God for the apostolic doctrine. I believe it with everything I have in me. Amen. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I believe in holiness and a separated life. I believe in that. Amen. But I'm telling you, amen, we better do as the disciples did. They, they, they happily received it. To, they were baptized that day, and then they continued in the apostles' doctrine. They went house to house. They took time. To invest in one another. Amen. Somebody make a move. Amen. I, I covet your prayers. Pray for your pastor. God to direct him. God to guide him. God to give him some insight. My own understanding to be enlightened. Amen. Then all each of us, our heart to be ready. I'm telling you, church, we've got a city to win. We've got a region to impact. And we're not going to do it individually. We're going to do it together as a body, as a team. Amen. Many members, but one body, one spirit. Come on, church. I want to invite you around this front. Amen. Can we together? God challenged me to see reality. Challenge me, Lord, to, to see things the way they really are so that I can make the appropriate changes. Hallelujah. I may have to face some things I don't want to face, but the result will be worth it. Hallelujah. Somebody. Make a move tonight. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful you are my treasure and my great reward and i just want to move your hearts it's all i want to do i just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you no matter how much the cost I freely give it all to you, all to you. And Jesus, Jesus, my offering, all my ambitions, my hopes, my dreams. And here's my life, Lord, a sacrifice. Oh, just to bless you. And I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you. No how much the cost I freely give it all to you all to you and I just want
gonna move your heart and get caught within your gaze right here in your presence God is where I want to stay I just want to waste my time waste my hours and my days on you all on you Jesus precious Lord none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful you are my treasure and my great reward and I just want to move your heart it's all I want to do I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you no matter how much the cost I freely give it all to you all to you and Jesus Jesus my offering all my ambitions my hopes my dreams and here's my life, Lord, a sacrifice. Oh, just to bless you. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you. Much the cost, I freely give it all to you, all to you, and I just want to move your heart, get caught within your gaze, right here in your presence, God. Is where I want to stay, oh, just to dwell in your house. Waste my hours and my days on you, oh, on you. Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my all out. Is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vows. Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody. Tell me what moves you. Tell me what moves you. And is it a fragrance? Then I pour. Out. And is, is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vows. And is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody. Tell me what moves you. Tell me what moves you. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do, I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost, I freely give it all to you. just want to move your heart and get caught within your gaze right here in your presence God is where I want to stay oh 
just to dwell in your house Waste my hours and my days on you Oh, on you Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my all out Is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vows Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody Tell me what moves you Tell me what moves you Jesus, hallelujah Hallelujah Amen God help us One thing I've learned in the last 20 years That if I Try to meet the expectation of people It'll kill me Elijah and Moses Both had a lot of things in common Both had made altars both had experiences with God on mountaintops, but both of them also asked God to kill them because they were trying to meet the expectation of people. Amen. Reality is, as a pastor, I am called to equip others for the work of ministry. I want to do a better job of that. God's going to help me do a better job of that. Amen. But it's not about the expectation of people. When, when we, when we, I'm telling you, that, that, that means, I'm, I don't want that to ever be my motivation. My motivation is I want to please Him. And if we'll do that, if we'll follow Him, if our heart be right with Him, I'm telling you, church, God, amen. Paul said we, we, we plant, we water, God increases. Amen. We have clearly defined roles. Amen. It's not my place to control. It's my place to equip. Amen. I believe, I believe and, and live as an example. Praise God that cultivates a, an environment, a culture that says, I want to I love Jesus. I want to fall in love with him. Amen. Isn't God awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I appreciate each of you. I want to I want to say this, and I mean this with every part of my being. You are wonderful people, and we are blessed. Amen. I, again, every day, God, thank you for putting me where I'm at. I would have never picked it, <laughs> never would have dreamed it, but God knew what He was doing, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm, Amen. Praise God. And I believe because you are wonderful people, all of us, we, we're striving. I want to be better. God, I, I want you to work on my life. And so we're going to submit to that, to him, and for him to accomplish that. Praise God. Friday night is our ladies' cookie exchange and ornament exchange. That's here at the church at 630. You guys have a wonderful time. If so happen you have extra cookies, you know, just let us know. Amen. If you need help. Test, test tasting any of them? Taste testing? Test tasting? Whatever. Amen. Any, any volunteers? No. Uh, then uh, Saturday at 6 o'clock here at the church is our Christmas banquet. Again, for those of you that may have never attended, um, we just have a good time. Amen. It is um, uh, casual. You can wear an ugly Christmas sweater if you want. Uh, we, don't, we don't come fancy. And uh, we have a great time, be great food. Amen. We've got the smoke master, Brother Payne, going to be smoking some briskets. Amen. And uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, this will be his what, third year? Third year? Yeah. Anyway, if he gets better every year, this year's going to be phenomenal. They were great last year. So, anyway, we're going to have a great time. Uh, sounds like we're going to have a great crowd. So, amen. We've, we've bought some extra tables, we've got some extra chairs. And uh, anyway, we'll, uh, I hope we just pack it out. Amen. Praise God. We'll have a great time. Um, of course, tomorrow night, recovery, uh, restart recovery at 630. Is it 630 or 6? 630. Okay. Amen. Tomorrow night. Praise God. Well, let's stand. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you today, God, for your blessings. We're thankful for your word. I pray, God, as you'll help each of us today. God, we don't want to go to battle without, without, the, without multiple swords. I pray, Lord, as you'll help each of us. Lord, bless every home and family. God, bless us and keep us. We give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You're dismissed in the wonderful name of the Lord.